I, uh, if anybody down there is is cool, feeling kind of cold, come on up here. It won't get up real quick. I thought it said 60 over there. <coughs> uh, not really sure. If this is 60, yeah, it's, it's uh, I just turned it down. It's it's going off. Yeah. Uh, anyways, it's, I think it's a lot warmer up here than it is out there. Yep. So, anyway, it's good to see y'all this morning. Uh, I uh, want to say I thought we had a, a lively and uh, uh, engaging Sunday school lesson this morning. I thought it was, uh, uh, we didn't get to everything we wanted to get to. But uh, I thought it was, uh, uh, thought, thought it went well, and uh, uh, good to see each one of you here today. And I just want to encourage you all. Uh, uh, I know that uh, Mary Jean is, uh, she was prepared uh, to have a young adult Sunday school lesson today. So next week, uh, Joe, you and Holly, and Jen, and whoever else that uh, we can recruit for that. Uh, you, uh, you won't have to uh, you won't have to listen to me. You can listen to Mary Jean. She, uh, she does a better job than I do. But I thought we probably would try that and see, see how that works. So I just want to encourage everyone to, to join us today. And, and let me say this: uh, you know, I'm a, a, I'm I'm going to be looking for some folks to, to help out with Sunday school. Uh, I uh, you know we all we all are reluctant. In a lot of ways to step up and, and do things. And I'm not trying. I'm not getting on anybody. I'm just saying that that I know that, that, that me and, and Mary Jean and a lot of times we just feel like we don't have much to offer. You know, gosh, what? I don't need to teach Sunday school. <clears throat> and, and and you're right. We we don't have the abilities to do that. A lot of us don't. But you know, with God's help, we can do all. Each one of us could be in here could be a great Sunday school teacher with God's help, and it's just a matter of uh, being willing to, to listen to Him and, uh, and and ask for His help. But uh, anyway, we have good Sunday school, and uh, uh, appreciate all those who were able to attend this morning. I'm going to be sharing with you uh, from uh, Matthew chapter 17. Uh, Transfiguration Sunday is today. Uh, and just like the kind of set up our scripture for today, it's uh, it's just after uh, Peter's confession of Christ. You know, remember Jesus asked Peter, says, "Who do you say that I am? Who do people say that I am?" And then he asked Peter directly, "Who do you say that?" I am? And he said, that "You are the." Christ, the Son of the Living God, and then it was uh, also right after that Jesus predicted his own death, uh, and Peter thought it would be good to rebuke him and say he shouldn't be talking like that. And, and you remember Jesus's uh, words, "Get thee behind me, Satan," talking to Peter. And that's where our uh, our scripture is today, Matthew 17. And just a couple of thoughts on Transfiguration Sunday. Why is it today? Uh, well, uh, historically, uh, there, are, there are three days in the, in the calendar when it's celebrated. Uh, uh, it's not necessarily uh, a fact that it happened on today, but this is the day that we observe it. Uh, three days, uh, the Roman Catholic Church celebrates the second Sunday in Lent which would be two weeks from today. Uh, most other uh, denominations, including uh, us in the United Methodist Church, celebrated the Sunday before Lent begins, which is Wednesday, with our Ash Wednesday service. And then there's also uh, churches that, uh, that use the calendar of the Holy Days. They separate and they celebrate it on August the 6th. And... Uh, and I, uh, and this is where I want to, I want to read this to you. Uh, I'm not real 
Savvy on how to uh, print things off on a phone yet, but, uh, but I did have something that I wanted to read uh, about that. I thought, was, uh, thought this was pretty good going along with our lesson today. <clears throat> so, as we celebrate the United Methodist Church, the revelation of Christ's glory before the Passion, so that we may be strengthened to bear our cross and be changed into his likeness. The focus of the Lenten season is renewed discipline in walking in the way of the cross and rediscovery of the baptismal renunciation of evil and sin in our daily adherence to Jesus Christ. At Easter, which reveals the fullness of Christ's glory foreshadowing, foreshadowed in the transfiguration, Christians give themselves anew to the gospel at the Easter vigil where they share the dying and rising of Christ. In biblical context, the Synoptic Gospels narrate the transfiguration as a bridge between Jesus' public ministry and his passion. From the time of the transfiguration, Jesus sets his face to go to Jerusalem and the cross. I thought that was really good. And, uh, and I wanted to read that so you could really get the full effect of that. But today, you know, we, we're looking at this as, uh, as a bridge going from Jesus' ministry that he's had in his life, setting sights on the Lenten season that's about to start on Wednesday, heading toward Holy Week, and then we'll end up, you know, at the cross. You know, in on Easter, on actually on Good Friday, but also you know, the Easter celebration that, that we have here in the church, uh, and, I, and I think it's a good way for us to, to really start to, you know, Christmas is over, and, and all that, and, and all those distractions, and, and now, to me, this is really a serious time in the church, not that you know that it's. Uh, an unserious time in the church, but you know, this is the time when we really get down to what uh, what this is all about, why we're here, and what Jesus came for. Well, Transfiguration uh, uh, Sunday is, is uh, I think we all have known about it and, and read about it. It's where <clears throat> Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, they go up on the mountain, and he's transformed uh, from his normal likeness is the likeness of, 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 of someone who is much more holy as it, the appearance would be. I want to read to you the, the scripture this morning. It's in Matthew 17, 1 through 13. So that after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them. And a voice from the cloud said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The disciples asked him, Why then did the teacher of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him but have done to him everything they wish. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. 
May God bless the reading and hearing of his word. Uh, let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, I thank you for your word that you have for us today. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart and, and Lord, the, the thoughts of each one of us today will be acceptable on your side, Lord, for you are a rock and our being. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> now I, uh, this is always a, a, a scripture that is uh, taught typically this time of year. Uh, it's in the, the lectionary as we preach today, and I'm sure you've probably heard this, this preach many, many times. Uh, don't know that I have anything new or exciting for you today, but one thing that I, I think that I do have is, uh, like our Sunday school lesson this morning, uh, I think what we have today is a reminder for each one of us uh, where we stand, where we are, and, and where we fall short in many ways in, in our life in the church and the way that we try to serve our God. When I when I hear these words, I, the first thing that comes to my mind is if I were one of the disciples, would I have been one of the three that Jesus took up the mountain? I would have liked to, I would like to think that I would have been. Uh, but that is, uh, I guess that is my own uh, prideful nature and uh, I guess it goes uh, back to watching the Ten Commandments as a child. I always wanted to be Moses standing before the burning books. I wanted to be that person who's fortunate enough to to witness that in person. And in some respects, I'm, uh, I'm no different than Peter. Peter gets a lot of, uh, uh, he gets a lot of uh, not negative comments uh, directed toward him, a lot of criticism. Uh, but but I, in some ways, I feel like I relate to Peter. You know, here they are, they go up the mountain. And all of a sudden, Jesus is transformed. He's transfigured. And uh, the scripture tells us that his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light, white as snow. Kind of uh, reminds me of the, the image I have of Charlton Heston coming down the mountain after he got the Ten Commandments. You know, his beard was all white, his hair was white, and he was all glowing and uh, had that appearance uh, and I guess that's what happens to you when you're in the presence of God. And I always wanted to be that person. And here is uh, Moses and Elijah appearing there with me. And what does Peter do is he steps up there in normal Peter fashion and he said, Lord, and, and, you know, in, in, in the NIV, uh, it says, put up three shelters. And in other translations, it says, put up three booths. And, uh, you know, a preacher, one of the preachers that we had one time preached that sermon about the three booths. I don't know, booth, what's he talking about? Well, you know, the booth is a tabernacle, it's a shelter, it's a to lean to some place to shelter you from the storm up on this mountain. See, what Peter was wanting to do is he would have gone up the mountain with the Lord and experienced glory. He had experienced a mountaintop experience. He, he was there with Moses and Elijah and Jesus. And he wanted to stay there. And isn't that just a natural reaction? It would, it would be like if, if we were taken up to heaven 
for a few minutes and said, well, you know, here's what heaven is like, but now you've got to go back to earth. I don't know anybody that would experience that and would want to come back here. I don't think I would. As much as I love my, my wife and my life and my friends and my church and everything, I don't know that I want to come back to earth after the experience of glory of heaven. <clears throat> and I'm sure this was very similar to that. And, uh, but the reality is, we cannot stay on the mountaintop. You know, eventually, those mountaintop experiences, those great and wonderful times that you have, those great experiences that you have in a church service, at a scene, or wherever it may be, sooner or later they come to an end and you got to come back down the mountain. And normally, when you come back down the mountain, you end up in a battle. And you know what's ahead. Something that's going to be at least not as good as that mountaintop experience, and you want to stay there. <clears throat> but one thing that's very interesting about this, in verse 5, it says, While he was still speaking, a bright cloud developed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love, and with him I will. Please listen to him. You know, the key verse of that, the key words of that was that the Holy Spirit or God or whoever it was that was speaking to, to them that day, it, they interrupted him. They stopped him in mid sentence. You know, so obviously what he was saying wasn't, uh, wasn't really important. And it, 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 they didn't correct him and say, telling him that it was, it was very selfish on his part to want to stay there, even though it was. A good idea that Peter thought, you know, they needed to go back down, and Jesus needed to come back down and finish his mission. <clears throat> but another thing that I want to point out to you is, uh, you know, if you look over in Matthew 22, 34 through 40, talks about the greatest commandment. It says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees and Pharisees got together one of them, an expert of the law, tested Jesus with this question. He said, Teacher, which of these, which, of, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. The second is like, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. You know, I thought it was interesting that Moses and Elijah appeared with Jesus. And I just thought, well, you know, most of my life I thought, well, you know, those are just great men of the Bible. They are just men of distinction, men of great faith. But what they represent here, and I think this is really interesting, they, they represent, Moses represents the law, Elijah represents the prophets. And I think that's the reason that they were, they were, their presence was revealed to Peter at this time. <clears throat> Peter, James, and John were there, and uh, they received this wonderful blessing of seeing Moses and seeing Elijah there with Jesus. But, but that was. God's way of revealing to them, Jesus' way of revealing to them that this is uh, what Jesus has been telling you all along. Uh, the blessing he received from heaven, the transfiguration that he received in his, in his body. This was just a fulfillment of the scriptures, of the law, and of the prophets. You know, because Jesus said, I didn't come to, uh, to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He came to fulfill all the words that the prophets had told him. That Jesus had to come and he had to, to suffer all of these many things. So as we look at, at today being the day of transfiguration that we celebrate in the church, I want us to think about the idea of this being the bridge. The big, thus being the bridge that we step over from uh, the first two months of the year into the Lenten season, which will 
bring us into the Easter season. The church always has to focus on the cross, I think. The majority of churches today have a cross prominently displayed in the church. Most, most churches do. But I think the Easter season is when we really focus on that you know, more than any other time. When really, uh, it should be a focus all the time. And what Jesus has done for us. And when I, when I think back of, uh, of what Jesus does for me, and what, he, what he has done for me, I think back of that, that boy, I don't deserve this. And it just, it just makes me feel very humble. And so I think a lot of times we as humans, we, uh, we don't want to think about all the bad things we've done and all the ways that we've uh, experienced uh, sin in our lives and all the bad things that we've done. We want to relive and we want to stay on that mountaintop like Peter was wanting to do. I know that uh, I think back to some of the, the high points in my life in, 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 in church. Uh, you know, I wish every Sunday could be like that. But unfortunately, they're not like that. Unfortunately, we have those uh, those days that we're living in the battle. So, you know, today, as we have the, the Ash Wednesday approaching, uh, I would just challenge you to, to just think, think about how we can change our lives, how we can uh, do things different in our lives. How we can uh, how we can live the life that our Sunday school lessons are teaching us? How can we reach out to other people? How can we help more people in our lives? How can we be more obedient? How can we put God first in our lives rather than our own selfish desires? Our Sunday school lesson this morning was uh, was just a reminder to us. How we, I'm sure that each one of us have great ideas of what we would like to see this church become. I know that I do. And I would say each one of you do as well. But the main thing, and you've heard me say this before, is what does God want for this church? And do we really know? And I'll be the first one to stand up here and tell you that I really don't know exactly where God is is leading this church. But just because I haven't got an answer yet doesn't mean he's not going to answer that tomorrow. But I want to I want to make a concerned day. Me as, as your pastor and as the shepherd of this church to uh, to use the season coming up to really uh, to do the best that I can to try to be a leader for this church and to help us to get in, in, in more in line with what God wants us to do. And I think what that is is to follow the Ten Commandments, live them each and every day. And, and more closely, just if you just want to be just really simple about it, Use the scripture that I just read about the greatest command. Is, is God uh, the Lord of our life? And are we loving our neighbors as ourselves? If ten is too many for us to remember, certainly we can remember the two. If we can do those things, then I think our Lenten season will be uh, more memorable. And, and it will produce more fruit in our lives. And, and each day, as we try to draw closer to God, try to make Jesus more of, of the Lord of our lives, I would uh, I would say that, that our church will grow closer to each other and grow closer to God. Now, we may not grow into the biggest church in Gaston, that may not be what God's purpose is for us. But I think God does have a purpose for this church. 
because I look around the room and I see each person and I get to know you. Uh, I, I see folks here who, who love God and want to serve Him in a, in a better way. And, and I just hope that in some way I can, I can help you in, in, in moving forward in that direction. I want, I want to share a, a little story that uh, I, I was telling Ron this morning that last night Mary Jean and I were fortunate enough to uh, be invited to the 50 year celebration of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes for the University of Alabama. And, uh, and I can tell you uh, that I was not involved in the European FCA while I was there. I was in high school. But a lot of my friends were, and I saw a lot of my, my good friends there last night. And I, uh, and I, mean, I will say this, that uh, I was really proud of the fact that the University of Alabama's FCA chapter is the longest running FCA chapter in the country. Long as continuously running FCA chapter in the country. And a young man that uh, graduated last year, Eric Jones, who many of you may have known for his football accolades, All American, he was there. He's the son of a friend of mine that I went to school with, Rex Jones. And Barrett was there, and he's well known for his uh, mission activities and, and uh, sharing the gospel and just being a fine, upstanding young man. And, and, and he said something last night that was, that was really interesting and kind of uh, hit me right in the heart. And I, and I think it just ties in really well with today and, and our leading up into Lent and Easter. Uh, but he was talking about that when he got to Alabama, his number one goal, and this is the goal of, of every player, this is what they drill into your brain the minute you get there on the campus is winning the national championship. Winning the Western Division, winning the SEC, that's never talked about. At least it wasn't when I was there. It's always the national championship. He wanted to, to lift up that crystal ball and kiss it and have the confetti falling down on his head on TV. And he was very fortunate enough that, uh, that he experienced that in 2009, 2009, 2012. Well, going back to 2009, his first year, he got that ball and he kissed it and he woke up the next morning, you know, and he was like on top of the world that night before, but he woke up the next morning and he felt all hollow and empty inside. You know, he had achieved his goal. He had climbed it. He had, he had experienced that mountaintop experience, and then it was gone. He felt hollow inside, you know. What else? Well, you know, I'm trying to win another national championship next year. It's not already done that. And he realized, that, and, and I believe, that the Holy Spirit convicted Barrett Jones is he looked at himself as a football player who was also Christian. That's how he was known. And that's how he was portrayed on television. And that, that was his identity. He just was a football player who happened to also be a Christian. And he said that, uh, that he was convicted of that. And that he went home and he got on his knees and he sat down and he asked God to change his heart. Barrett Jones asked God to turn him into a Christian who also happened to be a football He wanted to be a Christian first and then also be known as a football player. And I think for anybody who knows Barrett personally today will, will feel like that God answered his prayer. Because I think first and foremost, Barrett Jones is a Christian who happens to be a football player. And I, and I thought about that. And, that. and that hit me right between the eyes last night. You know, see, Barrett, he's, he, he was like Peter. You know, he, he was on top of that mountain. And he wanted to stay there. But very quickly, he realized that he had to come down off of that mountain. And he did. 
the next morning he woke up in his hotel room. I think they were in Pasadena at the time. And he just realized that it was all over. And I've been there. Not after winning the match championship, but I've been there the day after uh, big things have happened in my life. And, and, and I felt godly. Like, you know, it's over. You know, I, I can remember, you know, the days of Christmas, you know, and you're all you just wait for Christmas to come and all the excitement to open up the presents. And then you, you, know, you get up and you open up the presents, you eat breakfast and, and you clean up all the paper and the mess and that afternoon Christmas is over. No more gifts, no more hoopla, no more anticipation. Well, folks, there's more to winning a championship there's more to open presents in this world. It's all about that relationship. I'll tell you something else that, that he shared last night that was, that was really uh, and made an impression on me. He shared this. He said that, uh, you know, Jesus uh, is our Savior. I think we all, we all would agree that we can relate to that. Jesus is our Savior. When I think about my wife, I, I've heard her talk many times about how Jesus is her friend. And, and how, uh, and I know she, she tells us the, the story and, and how uh, the person she was sharing with just, it just kind of blew their mind. They never thought about Jesus being their friend. And Jesus wants to be our Savior. He wants to be our friend. But folks, and this is what Barrett shared last night. He said, Jesus, more than anything, wants to be the Lord. He wants us to be the focus of his life. You know, the, the cross has to be more than, than a monument hanging in our church or around a chain, a chain around our neck. The cross has to be more than that. You know, yes, he, he wants to be our Savior, and yes, he wants to be our friend, but he wants to be the Lord of our life. Is Jesus the Lord of our life today? Or are we just uh, using Jesus as a way to experience those mountaintop feelings? And then after it's over with, we just go back to living our life the way that we want to. I know that I have been guilty of that in the past. I've been uh, guilty of calling on Jesus when things were going. Not necessarily the mountaintop experience, but the, the lowest valley experience. Jesus, I need you now. Well, Jesus wants us to call on him all the time. On the mountaintop, in the valleys, and all the times in between. Do we have that relationship with him today? Do we have that relationship that is, is a 24 7 relationship, or do we just Keep him in a box and take him out when we need him. That's a question I have for us today. And I just want to challenge you. We enter into this Lent season, starting Wednesday night, and preparing for, for Easter and Holy Week. Do we have that relationship? Is Jesus our Savior? Is Jesus our friend? Is Jesus our Lord? I hope the answer to all three of those questions is yes for each one. But as musicians come and, and we're going to sing, uh, I just uh, we just ask that you just uh, prayerfully uh, think about your your situation, your relationship today, and, and it doesn't need to be adjusted.
come back tonight. Uh, we've uh, invited a few friends to come and join us. Uh, we've got the band from Howlton coming, the Bluegrass Band. They're going to sing a song or two and help us with our congregation to sing it. Hoping that the, the quartet is uh, is going to sing tonight, and uh, and uh, just just expect a really nice time. We're going to have refreshments afterwards. Uh, I see uh, somebody's been back there decorating, uh, looking pretty and nice. And uh, just hope everyone will come back tonight at six o'clock. Anybody else got any announcements they want to make? Four All right. Well, we'll see y'all at. Uh, uh, bar practice and uh, in the singing service tonight at 6 o'clock. Let's start. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for today. Thank you for the sunshine. And Lord, I just ask that you just watch over us now as we travel back home. And Lord, that, Lord, give us the strength to come back here tonight and sing praises to you. For it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.